we will, we will read the gospel at the end of the message today. And, and the message, though, it focuses on our confirmands, it focuses on the church. Because I want you to hear what it means to be a part of the church. Today we brought in many of the symbols that remind us of who we are. The two candles that for us remind us of the two tablets that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. The two tablets that were given in the wilderness. When, when the people asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He gave them two commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, like the first, thy neighbor as thyself. So these two lights represent this as well. But they also represent that God gives us the light. That it's not dependent, and we don't depend upon the light somehow mysteriously coming out from within us. But the light comes from above and to us and then dwells within us. God's Spirit dwells within us. But it all begins with God. These two lights that we light every week remind us of the Creator God who created us and then did not forget us, but who stands by us through our lives. We also brought in this font, which contains water, a memory of the people of God who passed through the water, of Jesus' baptism, and of your baptism if you have been baptized. It will remind us again today as the confirmands are called to remember their baptism, or those who are being baptized, to receive the baptism of God as if the Holy Spirit is pouring over your lives. When the water touches you, it will be, let it be as the Holy Spirit pouring over your life. Let it be as God himself comes to tell us that we come through the water into the life of God. We are told as a church to baptize. God gave this authority to the church through the ages. And we stand on that great truth. We also brought in the scripture today to remind us that we are held together in the tension of this book. This book that holds for us the words that come to us inspired by the Spirit of God and given to us as a sacred text to let us know that the Word of God is still with us and as we hear it in the power of God's Spirit, we hear the very words that are spoken to us and given to us by God. We also come to together today as a body of Christ entrusted with these gifts, with the light with the font, with the table that represents the sacrament of, of Holy Communion, with the book that holds our sacred text that calls us together. But I would remind you of an even greater truth, that God in each generation calls the church to use all the resources that we have, past, present, and even that that will come to us in the future. For when we worship God together, we call together past, present, and future. We will read the scripture knowing what we know today, but praying that God will illumine our hearts that we might rightly interpret, rightly divide, as St. Paul said, the word of God. Studying to show ourselves approved in every generation, seeking the truth of God as a people of God. Now I'll tell you a mystery. When this class is confirmed today, they are not confirmed as Methodists. Did you know that? Well, just in case you didn't, I wanted you to know. They will be received into this part of the body of Christ, which is a United Methodist congregation, First United Methodist Church. They will be received into this body after they have been confirmed. But they are confirmed as members of Christ's Holy Church. Of Christ's Holy Church. Now, I told you that Friday night they had a worship service in which they came to make their profession of faith. And I'm going to repeat for them and for those parents who came to the early service today and they participated in that service as well, some of the same stories. But I want you to hear them as well. I felt in their lives, in their eagerness to come and to sit in that chair of, of affirmation of faith, a profession of faith, of giving their lives either again or for the first time to Christ. The kind of eagerness that I have seen in many of the protesters and the demonstrators around the world. And I want to tell you, it's high time 
that God's people got that excited about what we believe in, willing to stand up for what we believe in. And this group, well, they didn't want to be outdone. They got up and wanted to be there and were anxiously getting ready to get into that place. And they were so anxious that you would have thought, well, they're almost going to have a tug of war to see who gets to go next. But isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that their eagerness was to be there to make their commitment to Christ? And after we left, we heard from many of these young people, I felt God's presence there. And so did I. And so did all of us who were present on that evening. We're so grateful for all of you who worked for this class. But today we come to reaffirm our faith in Christ. Easter Sunday is not just a time in which we look at the beauty of all that surround us and we sing songs that we love to sing and love to hear. I've heard many of you say Easter is my favorite service of the year. And judging from those of you who are here today, I hope that's true for most of us. It is our favorite service, for it raises the banner of hope high within the world. And thank God that the people of God will gather on this Sunday and will raise that great truth. But I would tell you that the church needs to raise its banner high. We need to call people to the kind of commitment that would let us live or die for Christ. That would let us live our lives and when it comes time to stand strong, to give our lives to Christ. There are some stories that I've told at Easter, but I want to tell them again today. I want to remind you because stories that are worth telling are worth telling more than once. The disciples of Jesus went out into the world knowing that the risen Lord has come. And they went to tell that story with such a determination that many of them died martyrs' deaths. In fact, eight at least of the disciples we know died martyrs' deaths. But they're not the only ones over the years who have stood strong and for the cause of Christ. There are those who are doing this today in our time. And there are those who have done this in my lifetime, in your lifetime. And those who will do it again. One of the great stories that comes from when Stalin was dictator in Russia is a story of, that comes out of the Russian Orthodox Church. They were not allowed to have worship together as a body except one day a year, and that was on Easter Sunday. On that Sunday, to everyone's surprise, the church was filled because names were being taken. As people came into the service, the KGB was outside to write down the names of all of those persons who were compromising themselves to come to church. Would you have come to church today if you were going to get on the government's bad list? If you were going to be on a list where you were watched and it was difficult for you to get a job and you might be denied the opportunity to work or do your profession or denied a contract if you're a businessman or woman because you came to the church, would you have come into the church today if they were writing down your names and said, no, you're going to be on the bad list, you won't be considered? That was the price they were paying to come to church that day. And yet the church was filled, packed, overflowing. And it looked like it was going to be, it seemed as if it was going to be a glorious day. And then, at the moment that the priest stood to begin the service, the doors burst open with a loud thud, almost crashing into the doors. And members of the KGB and members of the military walked down the aisle and stood at the front. And one of those who represented the government stood up and began to say, there is no God God is dead. Why do you come here today? Why do you waste your lives? Why do you waste time on this false truth? This went on for 55 minutes. 50 minutes they stood and harangued the people. And then five minutes they stood and looked as the people wept in stunned silence at what had just taken place. And because the service had only been allowed to last one hour on this day in a service that normally would have been in the Orthodox tradition three hours long, they stood and said, you now have five minutes to speak, priest. And the priest, the old priest, stood up. He came to the high pulpit in that great church tradition in St. Petersburg. And he stood... And he looked with tears flowing down his face. 
wetting his beard, eyes red, and said with a voice that was scarcely audible beyond the first few people. And the people were standing. They weren't seated. They were standing, weeping. And the priest said, He lives. He lives. And a young student, a young student, a young boy, grabbed his piece of a Bible that was all he had, pages missing and torn out, but one that he treasured, held it high and began to shout, He lives! He lives! And an old woman, standing at the back, bent with age, took the shawl of her tradition off her head and began to wave it in the air and cry with her cracked voice, He lives! And soon the whole congregation caught up the cry. And they began to say, in the face of oppression, in the face of the injustice of that moment, in the face of the tyranny of that moment, in the face of the evil in the world, He lives! And it is the message that we have to say that speaks volumes. He lives! We have a light to shine. We have something to say to a world that's broken, to a world that's needy. But if we are silent, there is no word to go out. Who will carry the banner? Who will say in the face of the darkness of this world, He lives, even if it costs you, even if it costs you your life? When Ceausescu was the dictator in one of those Eastern Bloc countries, and the people began to rise up in the 80s and to overthrow some of the governments. He was strong enough to send the people back, he thought. So he lined up the government buildings with tanks and guns to protect it. But the people in the church decided that they would not face them with guns nor tanks, that they would not throw rocks, that they would not even shout at the people, that they would simply go and pray and sing and light candles. And so on the day of the demonstration, late in the afternoon on that cold winter day, with heavy coats around them, a young boy, scarcely 18 years old, named Daniel, came. He was to begin the lighting of the candles and pass the light. Something like we do on Christmas Eve when we pass the light around. But in this time, he passed the light facing the guns and the tanks of those who stood arrayed against them. As they lit their candles and sing, sang their hymns, as the light began to encircle the building, suddenly the guns began to fire. The demonstrators had done nothing. They had lit candles. They had prayed. They had silently sung a hymn. And suddenly they were being shot, killed. People were falling in the street. And Daniel was one of the first ones who was struck in the leg. A few days later, his pastor found him in the hospital. They had amputated his leg. Eighteen years old, it was gone. Because he had stood in a demonstration line to light a candle. He said, Daniel, I'm so sorry about your leg. And Daniel grinned and smiled at his pastor and said, Oh, pastor, I don't worry so much about the leg. I was the one who got to light the first candle. Who will be the light today? Who will be the light in our midst? Who will place Christ above all earthly pleasures, as our hymn says? Who will say, I will trust in Jesus no matter what I have to give up. Maybe I will have to live more simply. Maybe my calling will take me to places I might not otherwise go. Maybe I will be like the Apostle Peter when Jesus said to him, feed my sheep and when you are old they will take you to where you don't want to go and do to you what you don't want done. And Peter went and gave his life. Who in our generation will do that? I'll tell you, I believe I saw some of them sitting on these first two rows. I believe I saw that kind of faith in them. And some of them want to say a word to you.
And so I'm going to let them come right now and do that. that before confirmation I had already given my life to Christ but I really didn't fully feel him but on Friday night I regave my life to Christ and now I really feel him and I know he's in my heart and it's just the greatest feeling um hey I just wanted to say thank you to Miss Michelle uh, Whittle she's helped me through confirmation she's been great to have there and I've grown closer to God in my time through confirmation, and I've really enjoyed get, growing close to all these people who are great cr Christians, and it's been amazing. And thank you. When I first started confirmation, I didn't know what to think. I just thought it was something we had to do. But I soon found out that I was growing a lot closer to God and Jesus. I was learning more about the Bible, too. I also want to thank my mentor, Mr. Douglas, for always being there for me and for being my mentor. Thank you. When I first started confirmation, I didn't really know what it was about, but when I did, through all the confirmation group meetings and all like the one-on-one -on -one mentor to confirmation, it just kind of told me that I should be closer to God. And that Friday night when I did give my heart to God, it's just like I feel so much relieved and uh, being there with all my friends and they were they were having hand, their hand on me while we all prayed and it just made me feel so good so thank you and they speak for all of us I invite you to stand as we read the gospel Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ. 